One morning in Seattle, United States, a five-year-old girl named Amel woke up from her sleep and started making breakfast and lunch for school. After that, without showering and changing her clothes, Amel went out and approached the school bus. The bus driver was surprised because the girl looked like she had just woken up. Plus, she said that she couldn't wake her parents. Not long after that, the Drug Enforcement Administration office received a report that a husband and wife had died of an overdose. One of the special agents reported the discovery to his superior, Lucy. Here, Lucy was shocked because the address reported was her sister's house. Lucy immediately went to the scene and found her sister and husband dead on the living room sofa. They were both dead overdosing in their sleep. This incident broke Lucy's heart, so she was very ambitious about catching the perpetrator. Meanwhile, in the Seattle area, there's a man who owns a pizza restaurant named Mike. Apart from being a restaurant owner, Mike is also known as someone who really loves and likes children. Therefore, he became sole sponsor of a children's football club. But outside of that, no one knows that Mike is a member of a drug cartel whose job is to monitor and ensure the safety of cocaine smuggling from Colombia. That day, Mike invited the members of the soccer team and their coach because they managed to get trophy in a competition. A few days later, in a restaurant kitchen in Canada, the leader of the cartel, Daniel, was seen busy making coffee accompanied by Adam, his subordinate. Daniel then called Mike to ask for responsibility because twice, the delivery did not match the order. Daniel wanted Mike to go to the field directly to ensure the next delivery, while finding out the problems that caused the former delivery to not match the orders. In another place in Colombia, there are two kids and their mother who are waiting for the bus. The three of them were going to Chingaza National Park, where Santiago, the children's father, works. Long story short, they arrive at a remote garden in the middle of the mountains and forest. The garden was filled with coca plants, which are the raw material for making cocaine. Not long after, Santiago appeared and made his two children very happy. Both of them took turns hugging and receiving gifts from their father, then Santiago and his wife continued their work. There, they processed coca leaves, mixing them with special ingredients, then soaking them. Then they take the juice from the leaves in the form of a white liquid like coconut milk. The liquid was then pressed into powder and formed into a bar. A bar of pure cocaine was priced at $1,600 per kilogram. Meanwhile, after receiving orders from Daniel, Mike asked his wife for permission to go south in order to control product quality. His pregnant wife actually didn't want to give permission because she knew the trip would be very dangerous. But Mike reassured her that everything would be fine. Then in an apartment, an addict named John often spends his time consuming cocaine or other types of drugs. He is one of the couriers who usually delivers drugs from Colombia belonging to his boss, Daniel. But apart from being a courier, he is also a drug dealer. The products he sold were stolen from packages he was supposed to deliver. What's worse to make a profit, John was determined to mix the pure cocaine with chemicals. And that night, John invited two called girls to accompany him to a party. The next morning, John was visited by his friend, Alan. Here. Alan was asked to try John's concoction, cocaine with several mixtures. According to Alan, the concoction was stronger and had a quicker, pleasurable effect. But after that, Alan found the two call girls in John's room who were dying. Even when he checked, one of them was already dead. Both of them had overdosed, just like what happened to Emil's parents. Alan panicked, but John calmed him down and asked him to get rid of the two girls in exchange for some money. Not only that, John also promised that Alan would get a share in the next cocaine shipment. The offer was enough to make Alan interested and finally he agreed with the condition that the two call girls were transported in John's car. We went back to Colombia. After several days of producing the cocaine, Santiago is now ready to send it. He himself will go through the forest in Chingaza National Park and meet the buyer in Bogota. On the way, Santiago was about to be robbed by two strangers, but he immediately killed both of them. To erase the traces, Santiago immediately buried them. In another place, Alan, who was in an intoxication, even intended to put the two girls' bodies in one of the emergency rooms of a hospital. But without him realizing, across the road, there were two policemen who were watching him. Alan's suspicious movements made the policemen come over and unfortunately, in the car, they also found a weapon and three kilograms of pure cocaine. After being taken to the police station, Alan was visited by Lucy and interrogated regarding the discovery of evidence of three kilograms of cocaine. Alan was able to deny that the illegal items were not his. And after that, he asked for a lawyer. Lucy already understood that if Alan got a lawyer, the investigation could become more difficult. Therefore, she chose another way, pretending to let Alan go first. After that, Alan was immediately picked up and forcibly taken to an empty shot house. There, Alan was tied of the chain and left cold while Lucy was busy reading the newspaper. And not long after that, she left Alan alone in the dark room. In Colombia, Santiago has now left the forest and he continues his journey on a motorbike to a small restaurant, his usual place to meet the courier who was going to take the drugs to Canada. 
Not long after, Santiago was coming out of the toilet and he was surprised because it was unusual for Mike to pick up the shipment himself. Both of them didn't talk much. Mike immediately paid and left Santiago. From Bogota, Mike took the cocaine to Cartagena, a port city in Colombia. In a warehouse, Mike checked the cocaine to ensure its purity. After everything was confirmed, the delivery continued using a ship called Marlin to Mexico and Mike sent his trusted people. Mike and Adam went by plane and before leaving, he reported to Daniel that the goods from Colombia have left for Mexico and everything is safe according to orders. Arriving in Veracruz, a port in Mexico, the price of the cocaine has risen drastically to $8,000 per kilogram. From the ship, the cocaine was handed over to the first courier to be taken to Monterey using a truck. At first, everything went smoothly. The truck courier was driving his car until one time he was stopped by two policemen. Because the driver felt something strange, he immediately attacked them. Not long after that, Mike came from behind to provide assistance. That night, the courier arrived at his destination and the cocaine he was carrying was immediately hidden in the air ventilation hole. And the next day, the courier's room was visited by a man who would be the second courier. At this point, the price of cocaine became $10,000 per kilogram. On the way, the second courier tried to cheat by offering the cocaine to someone at a club. But because he was careless, one box of cocaine which he offered was actually stolen by a gangster at the club and this incident was seen by Mike, who was following the courier. The second courier then continued his journey to the next stop, to the house of Daniel's trusted man, who is usually called the collector. Here, all the cocaines were weighed one by one and the collector found a box that weighed less than one kilogram. The collector was very upset because this often happened at every delivery. And as punishment, the second courier was killed when he was invited to eat together. Not long after, Mike and Adam came out carrying a package which had been stolen. The next day, a young man came and he was a new courier who will take the cocaine to Tikai using a public bus. But it's not just any bus. The driver has collaborated with the cartel and is used to taking couriers to their destination. He already knows if there is an inspection on the way and he already has an acquaintance who will carry out drug smuggling on the bus. Everyone is checked and all luggage is collected near the bus. A sniffer dog has also detected cocaine in the blue bag, but the officer who has been paid immediately took another bag. That bag was checked, and there was nothing there. The bus passed, and the courier was able to continue his journey safely. Arriving at Tikate, the third courier went straight to a hotel where Mike and Adam were waiting to double-check the cocaine. After making sure the cocaine was still pure, Mike allowed the courier to continue his journey with the fourth courier, Armin. Meanwhile, Lucy returned to the empty shot house where she was holding Alan captive while pretending to torture him. It hasn't started yet, but Alan immediately asked for mercy and promised to answer whatever Lucy asked. On the other hand, Armin was a paratrooper. He even bring the cocaine by air. The route was passing through the International Sea in Mexico and entering the Death Valley National Park Zone in California. Armin will later plunge at the agreed point and here, the price of cocaine will be $14,000 per kilogram. This time, Mike will pick up Armin. While waiting for the plane to arrive in the middle of the National Park Forest, Mike spent his time hunting rabbits. After getting the prey, Mike immediately cooked it and in the middle of the cooking process, Mike was contacted that the parachutist was ready to go down. Not long after, Armin landed smoothly near Mike who had been waiting. After ensuring that the quality of the cocaine was still good, Mike invited Armin to rest for a moment and eat. While he rests, Mike calls John and says that the shipment will arrive in two days. At this point, the price of cocaine will be $21,000 per kilogram. John, who didn't know Alan's current condition, called and informed him about the cocaine delivery schedule. John planned to invite Alan to take part in delivering the package according to his promise yesterday, because Alan had helped him to eliminate the two overdose call girls. From the National Park, Mike was the one who delivered the goods. He's on the way to Seattle to meet John. At the same time, Lucy and Alan followed John to a hotel. Lucy told Alan to leave carrying a tracking device, then she approached John's room. This agent invited John to negotiate. Two days later, Mike finally arrived at John's apartment. He asked for Alan's identity, but John said he was a friend who would help with the delivery. Mike, who already knew John, let things go. And when John was getting ready, Mike checked the cocaine that was placed on the table, and he found that the cocaine was apparently not pure, because it had been mixed. Mike was very upset because so far, many overdose cases had emerged and it was most likely because the cocaine had mixed. Mike almost expressed his emotions at that moment, but he tried to be patient and find out the truth later during the journey. Then the journey finally started. After the car had been driving for several hours, they stopped to fill up with patrol. Mike, who was filling up petrol, accidentally saw Alan's cell phone which was lying in the middle seat of the car. On the cell phone, there was a message from a special agent about the location of the raid. After that, Mike immediately turned off the cell phone, took out the card and pretended that nothing had happened. 
Mike asked John to change position and he would drive. But it's actually Mike's way of being able to choose another route that was not monitored by the police. Not long after leaving the gas station, Alan realized that his cell phone was missing. Mike stopped the car and gave Alan a chance to look in the middle seat. But when Alan got out of the car, Mike shot him dead. This certainly shocked John, but he didn't do anything and continued to follow Mike. After that, Mike called for help and not long after that, a man came. The car that had been used by Mike turned out to have a tracking device installed and they finally continued their trip with a new car. Meanwhile, Alan's body was about to be destroyed by the man who came. At this moment, Mike had not said anything to John. They just continued their journey according to plan. In the afternoon, they arrived at the next stop, the house of a person who was called the guard. To the guard, Mike revealed that some of the problems had been resolved, but John was the perpetrator who mixed the cocaine which made their business chaotic. Hearing that, the guard gave Mike a gun to immediately resolve the problem. The two of them stayed overnight at the guard's house and continued their journey before the sun rose. That day, they had to cross the Cascade National Park to enter Canada. Initially, the journey was made by jeep, and when they entered the snowy forest, they continued on motorbikes. After getting deeper into the forest, the two of them continued their journey on foot. Before noon, they both rested to eat, and at that moment, John asked Mike about what he did to Alan. Mike said that earlier on Alan's cell phone, he found a message from a special agent who was ready to raid them. After that, Mike asked John about the mixed cocaines that were afloat. At first, John didn't admit it. But after Mike showed the evidence, John couldn't avoid it any longer. It turned out that all this time, John often stole the cocaine from the packages he delivered. He sold the cocaine he took and mixed them with chemical drugs to make a lot of profit. John also admitted that he was visited by a special agent from the Drug Enforcement Administration. But his false answer succeeded in convincing the agent that he had nothing to do with Alan. John asked Mike to leave him in the middle of the forest, but Mike refused because John had to take responsibility for his action later in front of Daniel. After resting, they continued their journey for a while and then set up camp for the night. The next day, they continued their journey while it was still early in the morning. They had only walked for a while, but John looked tired and not long afterward. He slipped on the edge of the river which resulted in the bag that John was carrying coming loose and being carried away by the river current. They panicked and immediately went after the bag because if the bag is lost, there is definitely a risk to their own lives. While Mike was busy looking for the bag, he slipped on a cliff. Even though John could have helped Mike, instead he let go of his grip. After that, John continued the search until finally he found the bag stranded on the riverbank. After making sure the contents were safe, John moved all the cocaine in his bag. He continued walking until he found Adam who was waiting in the car. John told Adam that Mike had fallen off a cliff and died while he had secured all the cocaine. Adam then took John to meet Daniel who immediately checked all the cocaine. Luckily, the cocaine had the right weight and at that moment, Daniel was seen calling someone and discussing about John. Daniel really likes John's good work and to discuss the next job as bonus. John is asked to come tomorrow night to the club where they usually gather. In another place, Lucy is increasingly frustrated because her raid plan failed. Plus, Alan was found dead. She asked for an arrest warrant for John on charges of double murder for killing the call girls and Alan. Lucy planned to look for John in Canada, while her subordinates would later be assigned to look for John in Mexico. The next evening, John met Daniel again and told him the details of Mike's death. John said that he had tried to help Mike but he had fallen into a ravine. At this moment, Daniel praised John again because he had managed to carry that many packages alone. Because at this time Mike was no longer there, John would be promoted to the person responsible for delivery. As his first duty tomorrow, John was asked to go to a warehouse in Cartagena, Colombia. So the next day, John, accompanied by Adam, went to the airport and Lucy happened to be there to accompany her men who were going to Mexico. Seeing John in front of her, Lucy asked the airport officer's permission to go inside, but her request was rejected and Lucy could only surrender to let John go freely into the jet plane that was waiting for him. After that incident, Lucy found out that the jet belonged to Daniel, a well-known businessman in Canada. Lucy was very sure that Daniel was the mastermind behind everything. After Lucy's men were sent to follow John to Columbia, Lucy went straight to Daniel's office and threatened to expose the drug business that he had been hiding for so long. Daniel casually answered that Lucy didn't have any evidence that could show that he was a drug dealer. Daniel reminded Lucy not to act beyond her capacity because what she's facing is not an ordinary business. Lucy will face many important officials in the government who will stop her at all costs. Shortly, the jet that took John and Adam arrived in Colombia. They then head to Cartagena to the warehouse where Mike first checks the cocaine taken from the farmer. When he entered the warehouse, John was surprised because there wasn't a single person working inside. And suddenly, Adam attacked John from behind, then John was held in the bathroom and left. 
After that, Adam was eating at a restaurant and he didn't realize that Lucy's man had been following him since from the airport. Now he knows the location of the warehouse in Cartagena and continues to monitor it. After returning to the warehouse, Adam approached John who was lying limp and then he was taken to the backyard of the warehouse to be burned alive. At that moment, a surprise appeared. Mike came and opened John's head covering. John's screams finally disappeared when Mike decided to shoot him in the head. Because of this incident, Lucy's man now knew Mike's face and identity and he followed Mike until he returned to Seattle. Not long after that, Mike returned to his routine at the restaurant. One day, Lucy came to the restaurant and immediately went into the kitchen to meet Mike. Of course, this made Mike surprised, but he immediately sat silent when Lucy showed him her plan. Mike asked whether Lucy would arrest him. Before answering that question, Lucy started talking about her hard efforts to eradicate drug dealers. At that moment, Lucy was desperate and felt that her efforts would be in vain because the drug dealers would continue to be there. While talking, Lucy took out a gun from her bag. At first, she just put the gun on the table. But when Mike asked if the gun would be used to arrest him, suddenly she did this. Lucy's decision is very realistic because even if one drug dealer is eradicated, as long as the network still exists, drug trafficking will definitely continue to exist. From that day on, Santiago still routinely sent drugs to Daniel and other suppliers marked with colorful ribbons on each bag. So this movie is a picture of how cocaine is produced, packaged, and then distributed. Apart from that, this film also highlights how people in the drug business are all greedy and only think about themselves. Hopefully, this story can entertain you guys. Thank you very much and see you in the next video.